It's important to spend a few moments on the actual interpretation of Moran's eye. This is particularly important because one tends to think of it as a correlation coefficient, and while it's very similar to a correlation coefficient, after all, it's called a spatial autocorrelation coefficient, it's actually very different. And the main difference is because of the role of the weights. Let's just start with the sign of Moran's eye and what it means. As I mentioned, the theoretical mean is not zero, but a little bit to the negative of zero, minus one over n minus one. So for large data sets, this is for all practical purposes zero, but for small data sets, it's not. So then when we get a positive, technically larger than one minus one over n minus one and significant Moran's eye, this implies clustering of like values. It does not imply clustering of particularly high or particularly low values because it could be either or some combination. This is often interpreted wrong and there are actual uh, examples in the literature where a positive spatial uh, autocorrelation coefficient, a positive and significant Moran's eye, is interpreted as evidence for clustering of, for example, high disease rates or something like that, which is actually not correct. So the only thing one can say when finding a significant positive Moran's eye is that like values tend to cluster. And this could be both at the high end or at the low end, or both. Uh, the opposite, negative and significant spatial autocorrelation with Moran's eye suggests alternating values. It suggests the presence of spatial outliers. It suggests what is called spatial heterogeneity. So it's actually not really a, a dependence in the sense of clustering at all, in fact, it's evidence of a higher degree of heterogeneity spatially than we would expect. The checkerboard pattern is the extreme example of this. So very important to remember that a positive significant Moran's eye uh, is only clustering of like values, not necessarily high or low in terms of interpreting. The uh, significance of Moran's eye we've already discussed. We can either look at the pseudo p values, which are derived from the reference distribution, but these are not real p values. These have to be considered with respect to the number of replications that were used. So I mentioned earlier that uh, in the extreme case where no reference distribution value is equal to or larger than the observed statistic uh, will have a p-value determined by the number of replications. So for 99 replications, this will be 0.01. For 999 replications, this will be 0.001 and, and so on. The comparison of the z-values that uh, result from this, um, from the analytical approach or from the empirical approach, is only approximate. There, there, are, there is one exact distribution result, but it only holds under a very restrictive assumptions and not necessarily uh, satisfied in most practical situations. The other thing to keep in mind is that the sign of Moran's eye is only meaningful when the statistic is actually significant. Because when the statistic is not significant, all that means is that we don't have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis of spatial randomness. So to say that there's positive or negative spatial autocorrelation in that case doesn't really make sense because we don't have enough evidence to not agree with spatial randomness. So, and under spatial randomness, there is no such thing as a sign of a spatial autocorrelation coefficient. So again, uh, care is, is needed in interpreting this because uh, when this, the coefficient is not significant, it basically means there's nothing we can do. Okay.
And as I mentioned before also, the Moran's eye is very difficult to compare. Unlike a standard Pearson correlation coefficient, where you know that 0.8 is always less than 0.9, that is not necessarily the case with Moran's eye, in, in the sense that, as we saw earlier, this, for example, the strength of the spatial correlation reflected by a coefficient of 0.34 is not necessarily larger than one with 0.33. And this is very counterintuitive, and everything uh, this has everything to do with the spatial weights in that the the properties of the statistic for inference purposes the, depend very much on the spatial weights that are used. So for the same weights and different variables, we can actually compare Moran's I because the comparison of Moran's I and the comparison of the Z values that correspond to it because we use the same weights and because the moments of the weights are the same, the comparison can be carried out, but not if the weights are different. And so this is a, a, a constant quandary, and it takes a little while getting used to if you come from this standard Pearson correlation world. Uh, you have to be very careful saying much about the Moran's I value as such. Instead, the standardized Z values can be used because they actually already took care of the differences in the weights through the different moments, particularly through the different variants. So in our example, uh, we mentioned, we looked at uh, previously um, with the queen, the K nearest neighbor and the distance bands, we saw that in terms of the Moran's I statistic as such, K nearest neighbor's value was the highest. However, after we correct for the different variances due to the different weights, we find that the Z value is the highest for the distance band uh, weights. And so in terms of the interpretation of the strength of the spatial autocorrelation, that would be strongest using the distance band weights. Then two more important concepts uh, to keep in mind when interpreting the results of a Moran's eye analysis. Uh, one is something I alluded to earlier, is the difference between clustering and clusters. Clustering is a global property. In other words, the Moran's I is a single number for the complete spatial pattern. It does not tell you anything as to where the clusters might be. It just says that the pattern as such is more clustered than it would be under spatial randomness. To get the location of the actual clusters, one needs a local statistic. So you may wonder, well, what do we need Moran's eye for then? Because it doesn't really tell us that much. Well, it does in a um, context of specification testing. For example, when you do regression analysis, you want to make sure that the error terms are uncorrelated which includes, as a special case, spatially uncorrelated. So here, Moran's I would be a good statistic to check whether or not this is the case, because you're not necessarily interested into where these clusters of residuals might be. For that, Moran's I is no good. You need a different approach. But you are interested in knowing whether or not this basic assumption underlying your regression analysis is satisfied or not. So Moran's I is a great a global statistic for specification testing. It is pretty much not usable to identify the location of the clusters. For that, we need a local statistic. The second aspect that is important to keep in mind is the difference between uh, process and pattern. And so Moran's I tells us something about the pattern. It tells us that there is clustering, so the pattern that we observe is not spatially random, but it doesn't tell us why that is the case. And, and this is very important because different processes can yield the same pattern outcome. The example I always use is if you do, say, cluster analysis of disease and you find a, 
a pattern of clustering of the disease in a given village. This clustering could exist because the water is spoiled and everybody drank bad water and got sick, or this clustering could be the result of somebody moving in, carrying the disease and spreading it to everybody else. The pattern as such does not tell you anything about the process. And in the literature, we make a distinction between true contagion and apparent contagion, because all too often, a pattern of clustering is interpreted as the presence of contagion. But that is not necessarily the case. That can be the case, but it's not necessarily the case. It's only the case in the presence of true contagion. So this is when clustering happens as a result of true spatial interactions, such as peer effects, mimicking, spreading a disease, uh, spreading information, adopting new innovations. Those are true contagion processes. In contrast, apparent contagion is, you can think of as something that looks like contagion but is not. And the clustering is really not due to an interaction effect, but rather to spatial heterogeneity, to different spatial structures that create local similarity. And this is very important for policy purposes, for example. Um, for example, uh, fighting crime. If heightened crime in neighborhoods is the result of gangs moving in and they spreading the violence to each other, that's true contagion. On the other hand, if the higher crime is the result of low economic circumstances, uh, persistent poverty, high unemployment, no jobs, no access to jobs, then it would be apparent contagion. That's a structural effect, that is spatial heterogeneity. So very important when interpreting these uh, spatial autocorrelation statistics is to keep in mind that first of all they are global, they pertain to the pattern as a whole, and secondly, secondly they do not inform about the actual process that caused the pattern. Next we turn to Giri C.